Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to be looking at how to get started with a massively popular microcontroller, the NRF52 from Nordic Semiconductor. So if you've never used the NRF52, you can start by following the reference design, but what I'm gonna show you is a custom design that uses the NRF52 and a few other parts, and then how to get started placing all this stuff in the PC layout. So, let's get started. Okay, so to get started with the NRF52 microcontroller, of course, we're gonna have to look up some part details and then we're gonna get some components into a schematic. So if you haven't started using Altium Designer or you haven't gotten a free trial, make sure to go to the link in the description, get your free trial, and you can follow along with this tutorial. So what is the NRF52 microcontroller? Well, this is a wireless microcontroller. It has a transceiver built into the microcontroller, and it's got multiple IOs on it, and it's a very small microcontroller. So it actually comes in a BGA package as well as another package type, and it can be used for very small IoT devices, small wearables, and any other product that just needs to have a small but powerful processor with RF capabilities. So if we take a look at some of the literature and some of the specs on the NRF52 microcontroller, you'll see it comes in two possible packages. So here in this window from DigiKey, you can see I have VFQFN package with 73 pins on it. You can see it lines up all the pins around the outside of a die attached paddle here in the center of the component. The other option is a fine pitch BGA. And as we'll see in this upcoming tutorial that I'm gonna show you, it's actually a very fine pitch PGA. The footprint is 0.35 millimeters. So that's pretty fine pitch. So that's the component that we're gonna work with. So it's this part number that I have right here on the screen. And this part number will require a few HDI practices in order to be able to route signals in and out of the footprint on this microcontroller. So I'm inside Altium Designer right now. I have a schematic up and in this schematic, you can see here, I have the star of the show, NRF52840. This is our microcontroller. Um, again, you can see the part number right down here. So if you want, you can go through and search for the data sheet on this. You can probably find the footprint out there as well. Here, I've got several different ports on this. The reason for that is because this is actually part of a larger project and the ports are used for connections to other sheets that are not currently in this intro project. And some of the stuff that's on here, you can see we've got an SPI bus. You can see we've got an I2C bus, and there's actually I2S that you could instantiate in some of these pins. And then we also have some SWD connections here. So the SWD IO, and then the SWD clock, and then the end reset are connected to a debug header right here. We also have power monitoring through this debug header. Then coming off of that debug header, we have the battery power, and then we have a power output for VDD1. And this is our main power that's getting supplied to this NRF52. So this NRF52 is not what we would necessarily consider a super high speed component, simply because it is only running with slower single-ended buses, namely I squared C and SPI. It also has some IOs on it. Um, you can instantiate IOs and some of these other pins if you want. The other thing that we have here is we have an EEPROM. So this EEPROM, again, comes in off of battery power. The EEPROM is actually right here. This runs off of its own VDD port. The VDD port is right here coming off of uh, this regulator. And so if we go over here and get the part number right here, you can see that this is an LDO supplying a bit higher amperage than this LPO coming off of this power regulator. So that's everything that we have in this system. And then last but not least, we have a low side reverse bias polar protection integrated circuit. All of this gives us our power regulation and then all of that feeds into our two main chips, which are just an EEPROM and then the NRF52. So since we have all of our circuitry ready to go, we're just gonna import it into a new PCB. So I'm gonna go to add new to project, click PCB, and I'm gonna save this guy. We'll call it NRF-intro PCB. Make sure that's all saved, save the project, and then we'll import all the changes into the PCB. Obviously, we wanna make sure that all of these imports check out. Um, I hate adding in rooms, so I'm just gonna uncheck it and then execute the changes. 
and we see that everything imported successfully. So we've got all of our components here imported into the PCB layout, and it might not be clear which one is the microcontroller, but if you zoom in right here, you can see that this is our microcontroller. This is our NRF52. So this is what I was talking about previously about the, uh, the size of this microcontroller. It's actually pretty small. It's actually comparable to some of the other components that you have in the design. And if I move this guy over here and we zoom in, you can actually take some measurements of the ball pitch if you want. So just to illustrate what types of pitches we're dealing with here, if I just measure the ball pitch here, you can see I've got 0.35 millimeters as I mentioned before. This is an instance where when you need to fan out this BGA, you need to decide how are you gonna fan this out? Well, the issue here is that with standard manufacturing capabilities, even on some of the thinnest laminates, you are not going to be able to do dog bone fan out. The reason for that is because the mechanical drilling required is gonna to be too large. The reason it's gonna to be too large is because even with like a six mil mechanical drill, the pad size that's gonna be on that is going to be too large to fit in between these two pads on the BGA footprint. And so because of that, you need to go with via in pad. So the first thing you need to do before you start doing any kind of fan out or placing via in pad, what you should do is of course, plan out the layer stack. Now, just to illustrate what type of layer count we're going to need, first it helps to clear out the error markers, and then you can zoom in and take a look at what the pad assignments are here in the footprint. So one thing you'll notice here is that we actually have a pretty big patch of ground pads, and these pads, all of these, need to connect to an internal ground plane. So that's the first piece. So we're gonna have a bunch of stuff here that's gonna connect to an internal ground plane. And we can do that through stacked vias. So we can do blind buried stacked vias. Then outside of that, we have at least one more row here. So we actually have two rows that we might need to then route using another layer. So we're gonna have our top layer for routing. Then we're gonna have one more layer below that. And then we're probably gonna need one more layer below that. So what we should probably do is have two thin outer layers in order to be able to reach all of the pins on this component. Now, if you look at Nordic Semiconductor's reference documentation without actually pulling up the PCB design files, you won't see them mention a specific layer count that you have to use. So you're free to use whatever layer count is going to work to make sure that you can fan out this component. So for this, I'm gonna go with a six layer board using two thin outer dielectrics so that way we can place via in pad with stacked blind and buried vias, and that way we can access these inner rows of pins. So to do that, we just go into design, select the layer stack manager, and then we're gonna add in some layers here, and then we'll set up our vias. Okay, so I have my layers set up. Here I haven't set the thicknesses just yet, and everything is set to one ounce copper. Here, if I'm just looking at the layers, uh, you can see here we've got two thin outer layers, and then we're gonna fill up the rest of the PCB with a thick core layer. So that's fine, we can do that. Um, but what we need to do is select a thickness here on these outer layers. Now, the thickness of these outer layers with standard FR4 laminates is gonna be limited to about four or five mils, depending on which manufacturer's materials you go with. So this is one of those issues where you either need to have those material options available to you from an off-the-shelf vendor, or you need to contact your fabricator and see what materials they have available so that they can support routing with this chip through these two outer layers that need to be very thin. I'm gonna go with four mils because the manufacturer that I have used on a project with this component does supply four mil laminates. They are normally about DK of four. And so I'm gonna put that in here as well. And then the core is usually about 4.8. And for our purposes, we're not so worried about the core at the moment. What we do wanna do is fill up the rest of this dielectric with about an extra 25 mils of space so that we hit our 62 mil target. So that's gonna set this inner layer thickness to about 37 mils, and that's pretty much it. So like I said, you would wanna make sure that you qualify this particular stack up with your fabrication house to make sure that they can produce this and that they can supply the materials that hit those specs. You should do this before you start putting in blind and buried vias to do the fan out. So after we do this, we can then select our via types and we can just add in a couple of via sets. Here, when we add in another via set, it already starts with a blind via going from one to two, and then we can have a buried via going from two to three. Once you have this set up, then we need to know 
what diameters for the drill and then what diameters for pads we can then use on these two vias. So that's gonna be the first step to then planning out the fan out for this particular component. Then once you have that fan out, you can start routing on the interior layers. So with a four mil thick dielectric on the outer two layers, what that's gonna require is a via with an aspect ratio of about one or possibly less. So remember the aspect ratio is the depth to the diameter ratio for that via. So an aspect ratio of one would give us a drill diameter of about four mils. So we're gonna set a four mil drill diameter and then we wanna be able to fill up the rest of that pad underneath this uh, component and that's gonna set our pad size to about eight mils. So if you look here on the component, you can see if we just scroll down, the pad size is already 8.346 mils. So we're gonna set our blind via our landing pad here to also eight mils. So I'm gonna go in and set the design rules to do that and then we'll look at how we can do this fan. -out. So I've set up all the design rules. They're pretty simple. We just wanna go through and set via styles. And then of course we wanna go through and set clearances. And we don't have anything with differential pairs in this particular design. And then of course trace widths. So here the minimum trace width is pretty important, especially once we're on an inner layer. The reason for that is because we might have to route in between some stuff and we may need to route in between via walls. So just be careful with that. The trace width on an inner layer can usually be a bit smaller than it is on the outer layer. You need to make sure that you set all of these minimum and maxima so that you can route very quickly and easily without getting into an issue where you have to place a trace and go back and change the width. Once we do that, we can then use either the automated tool to set up our blind and buried vias. So we can use the fan out tool to place all of this, or we can set those up manually. So what I'm gonna do is show you how to set this up manually um, in the PCB layout. The first thing you need to do is of course, save the layer stack, close this, save the PCB, come back to this top layer. And then from here, you can place a via. And you'll notice here by default, it's placed as a through hole going from layer one to layer six. We wanna place this as a blind via. And then we're gonna be using pad diameter of eight mils, hole diameter of four mils. And that's what we're gonna be able to use to then hit some of these inner pads. So what you can do is, of course, you can grab each of these pads if you want, and then you can, of course, copy this. And you can just copy this around to wherever you want it. And if you wanted to, you could technically stack a couple of vias here, such as on this ground pad and on these other ground pads to hit layer three so that you can connect to ground. Now, I think it's preferable to use the automated tool, especially once you get to a BGA that has a lot of pins on it. So instead of going through the automated tool, what I'm gonna do is just link to a video in the description. If you wanna learn how to use the fan out tool, check out the description and you'll see access to a video so that you can learn how to use that tool. The place where you actually access the fan out tool is right here. You can see it's under the route and fan out option. You can fan out based on a component, based on net, based on pads. There are several ways to do it. The typical way to do it is to build a room around a BGA and do it that way, but you could also do it by component. So make sure to check out that video. So just as an example, once we have this line on here, what we would wanna do is then, of course, take a look at the inner layer and you will then be able to easily route in here in the inner layer and touch this component. We can go through and do this um, on any of these other pins that we need to. One of the reasons for that is because if I were to say, you know, open up the trace routing tool and I just go over here, set the width to say four mils on the outer layer, my clearances are gonna be a little tight. And you can see here, this is a four mil trace, but it's already gonna be way too big to route in between these balls. And so that's why we need to have these vias here on this inner row. So that way when we are on L2, we can just route in directly underneath and then of course route into this via. So once that's finished, you can go through and do your placement, do your fan out, make sure that you stack the vias where you need to stack them, and then you can start going and routing into the design. That's how to get set up, at least with doing the fan out on this particular component. And I wanted to focus on the fan out because I think that's one of the major manufacturability issues. And that's an area where designers can get in trouble because if they don't actually check on what they need to do for those fan outs and they don't check the layer stack to ensure that the layer stack will enable that fan out, you'll start putting four mil through holes in this design 
and those four mil through holes are not going to be manufacturable on a standard thickness board. So make sure to tune in to part two because in part two, I'm going to show an example that shows routing coming into this component. I'll also show some of the requirements for making room for the antenna. There is an antenna that's going to have to come off of this. It could be a printed antenna or you could do a chip antenna. And if you actually look here in the schematic that I've got up, you can see here that we've set this up for a printed antenna. So we have a wideband matching circuit right here that was pulled from the reference design. This wideband matching circuit could then interface with the antenna that is present in the reference design. So keep all that in mind and make sure to tune into that next video. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. You'll get access to all the videos as they come out. And of course, make sure to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator on this stuff, folks. Yeah.